<coughs> so um, Osmocom GMR, it's one of the latest member in the Osmocom uh, family. Uh, I'll start with a quick introduction on uh, GMR um, generally, then a technical introduction on GMR1, and finally the software itself uh, that we wrote and um, how to use it. Okay, so what is uh, GMR? GMR stands for uh, geosynchronous, um, geostationary, geostationary Earth Orbit Radio uh, Interface, and it's an ETSI standard for um, satellite phones, so essentially these phones. Uh, ETSI is the same body that standardized GSM, and they reused a lot of uh, their specification for GMR. And uh, if you read the GMR specification, you will find lots and lots of reference to the GSM specification, sometimes referencing entire chapters. Um, GMR is um, two distinct standards called GMR1 and GMR2. They are not evolution uh, one of the other, so GMR2 is not a replacement for GMR1. They exist in parallel and they've been developed uh, by different vendor groups. Um, in this particular talk, we'll talk only about uh, GMR1 and uh, more specifically the first of the three revisions. So the, the first revision, just called GMR1, is the equivalent of a standard GSM to 2G circuit switched, so essentially voice and SMS and uh, nothing else. Uh, a later revision uh, came uh, and it's called GMPRS and it's uh, obviously the equivalent of GPRS, basically adding packet uh, data over GMR. And finally, the latest revision um, is GMR1 3G, um, which um, essentially adds more, more channel types for higher bandwidth and also interoperability with the UMTS core network. So um, where is it used? Um, one of the most important uh, deployment of GMR1 is the Turaya uh, satellite network and it's the one we, uh, we studied because it's the only one visible from Europe and since most of the, de uh, actually all the developers are in Europe, um, that's the only one we can receive. More specifically, the Turaya 3 satellite, uh, which is at uh, orbital position 44 east, um, is the only one we can see uh, exactly from here. There are other deployments, uh, for example, SkyTerra and TerraStar are in the US. Um, the, the other I don't, uh, ICO I don't really know well, and uh, Inmarsat was actually at some point just renting capacity on the Turaya satellite and didn't have its own satellite. GMR2 is used in uh, the Inmarsat ISAT phone, which is a quite well-known uh, network as well, but we won't uh, go into further details. So this is the coverage map for the co coverage map for the Turaya network, and as you can see, it pretty much covers everywhere except the Americas. Uh, but here in Europe, we are well within the optimal coverage zone, and so receiving it is, uh, is not a problem. So, it's heavily based on, on GSM, so it makes sense to, to compare it uh, a little bit. So, the first thing they did is they renamed everything. Uh, they changed, uh, basically, the, the B into the G for, of course, uh, gateway or geostationary, depending on the type. And um, um, the MS, which used to be the mobile station, so your phone is now called MES, which is Mobile Earth Station. Um, they introduced some useful stuff, so specialized features. One of them um, is the terminal-to-terminal -terminal calls. So if you, if from, from, from a Turaya phone, you call another Turaya phone to avoid to go through all the way uh, from the phone to the satellite, to the core network, back to the satellite, back to the other phone, uh, they introduced a shortcut where a phone can talk to the satellite and directly be bounced onto um, another phone without ever going through the core network. And another uh, feature, it's called eye penetration alerting. And this is because satellite phones don't, at least these models, don't work at all inside. Uh, you, uh, you need uh, almost direct uh, line of sight to the satellite, so to the, to the sky. Uh, but you still want to be able to receive um, uh, calls when you are inside. And so they have uh, some very specific channel types um, that, uh, that have much uh, higher coding gain, so that when you're inside, you cannot place calls, you cannot receive SMS or anything, but you can at least have a notification that, okay, someone is trying to call you, you have about 20 seconds to go outside and get the call. 
Um, so that's some, that can be useful. It has very tight link to GPS from the start. Um, for example, all the Almanac and Ephemeris, ephemeris data uh, from GPS um, are sent from the Turia satellite to help the phone get a GPS lock much faster. And the phone will actually report its position each time it opens the channel to the satellite so that the satellite knows exactly where you are. Um, they introduced a new codec because of uh, bandwidth limitation and they, they invented an, uh, a new cipher, but uh, we'll talk about that later. From a protocol stack point of view, the radio frequency layer and channel coding layer, so the, the lowest layer of the stack, are completely different. Uh, you find the same concept, but all the, de the, the details are, are, are really different, so different bursts, different modulation, uh, a lot more channel types to handle special cases. Um, Above that, you have the data link layer, um, which is called here LAPSAT instead of LAPDM. Um, both are based of, of the uh, LAPD in the ESDN world, but they've been adapted for the peculiarities of satellite. Uh, that is um, very, very long delay, because the satellite is like 36,000 kilometers in the sky, so for each uh, round trip time, it's like 240 milliseconds, which is uh, quite high. Um, on the layer three level, I will detail all the layer afterwards, but uh, quickly on the layer three level, the RR, which is res radio resource, is again completely different, and we'll see how it is different. Um, everything above that is exactly the same as uh, GSM, so no difference whatsoever. Uh, small peek into packet data, um, the situation is similar. That is, the lower level, which are R RLC and MAC, uh, are different, but LLC and above uh, are completely common. So this is um, an overview of a GMR network. And uh, you can see the protocol stack, the protocol stack um, on the bottom. Everything that is in color is um, specific to GMR. Everything that is in white is common with GSM with no modification whatsoever. So as you can see, everything that is in the core network uh, is common, is shared with GSM, uh, exactly the same. So, in detail, you have the, the satellite, which communicates um, with the phones on Earth, obviously, uh, using what's called spot beam. So, they are the equivalent of um, cell uh, in, in the GSM world. Um, spot beams are um, artificial small zone of coverage uh, that are generated by the satellite using uh, beam-forming beam algorithms. Of course, when I say small, it's small at the you know, planetary level, so it's like 100 kilometers uh, wide. It's not that small, but uh, something like that. Um, the signal is bounced back to what's called the uh, GTS, uh, a combination of the GTS, the GSC, which is a gateway transceiver station and gateway... Uh, it's, it's GCS, actually, if there is a typo. Uh, it's a gateway controller station. And from there, it goes through the GSM core network, so MSC, HLR, uh, typical GSM stuff. Uh, something that's interesting to note is that the satellite um, only plays a role at the physical layer, so data link layer is entirely handled um, from the phone to the gateway station, and uh, it's not touched at all by the, the satellite. The satellite doesn't have much logic. It just bounces back the signal into an aggregate uh, feeder link. So as I said, the, the physical layer um, using spot for the communication uh, between satellite and form using uh, spot beam. Uh, it is a frequency duplex, like in GSM, so you have a part of the band that's reserved for communication from the phone to the satellite, and another part of the band that's uh, reserved for the inverse direction. Uh, it's divided into RFKIN, 1087 of them, which are not, uh, not actually very wide, they're only 31 kilohertz compared to GSM, which is something like uh, 280 kilohertz, uh, so they are very uh, small channels. The feeder link, so that's the link between the satellite and the main uh, gateway station uh, on Earth, uh, can happen either in C-band or in K-band, but that's about uh, all that's said in the specification. Um, there is no other technical detail available, um, at least publicly, um, 
to what exactly happened on, on that feeder link. So let's take a look at the physical layer in a little more detail. Um, as in GSM, it's entirely synchronous, uh, a complex TDMA scheme. Um, in some aspect, it's simpler than GSM. Um, in some aspect, it's more complex than GSM. Uh, it really depends on, on where to, to look, but basically, they have to take into account power consumption um, because something very important on the satellite is that um, there are some broadcast information that is sent permanently, uh, I mean, all the time, uh, okay, periodically, I would say, and they have to make sure that they don't transmit that information at the same time in all the spot beam because this would create a um, very high peak in power con consumption on the satellite. And so this is reflected somewhat in the, in the TDMA alignment, and, the, and you have to, to take, care, uh, take care of that. A uh, major difference compared to GSM is that, uh, okay, so you can see one, one, of the, one of the TDMA frame here is composed of, of uh, 24 time slots. And um, the, the burst, that is the packet of information exchanged on the network, can occupy several consecutive time slots, which was not the case in G GSM, uh, in GSM 2G at least. Um, one of the main problems in the physical layer is the synchronization. That is, when a phone is powered on, it needs to find um, the, the carrier, es essentially. So it needs to detect, is there a carrier on that particular frequency? Um, how is it aligned in time? And what is the frequency error? Because um, the modulation requires a very precise uh, synchronization between the clock of the cell phone and the clock of the satellite. And the crystals and oscillators used in the phones are not, um, are not that good. And so um, the error must be detected and compensated. And I think they found a very elegant solution in, um, in this particular waveform, which is called the dual chirp. So a chirp is a um, single tone that is varying in frequency over time. Um, the, the graph, uh, the, the picture, represents uh, frequency vertically and time um, horizontally. And so you can see that you have two spikes in frequency that uh, crosses each other over time, drawing kind of a X in the, uh, in the waterfall display. And um, I won't go into all the mathematical detail, but uh, this waveform has very interesting property. Most notably is that if you, um, cap if you capture roughly where this waveform is using a, you do a rough acquisition by a co simple correlation, it won't be very precise, but it will be good enough to know more or less where it is, like in this window. Um, and then you multiply that by uh, a reference up chirp, so only the ascending part, you do the FFT and uh, you take the peak, uh, peak frequency of the FFT, you call that F1, you do the same time for the down chirp. And kind of magically, uh, the time alignment error will be proportional to F1 minus F2 and the uh, frequency error will be proportional to F1 plus F2. Um, if you're interested in t into why exactly that is, you can follow the link, there's a very interesting paper. Um, about it. Um, so, um, packets of information are exchanged in bursts on the on the physical layer, and they are modulated using what's called a Pi4 CQPSK, uh, which is a modulation uh, which is completely different from uh, from GSM. Again, um, there are two slight different uh, variations. One uses a quad phase um, shift keying; the other only has uh, two-phase shift king, but these are the two uh, modulations that are the most used onto the, the physical layer. Um, they are relatively easy to demodulate, and, and we'll see that uh, later on. Um, there's a lot of different of burst types, uh, too much to list here, but um, it's, uh, it's the, the, the modulation uh, doesn't change between them. There are other types of channels that, that have very specific purpose, like for example, the eye penetration alerting has a very specific type of burst, and um, there are some keep alive bursts that are used in, in very specific cases that uses different modulation represented on the, on the bottom. 
and um, and also for GMPRS and, and 3G, you have um, more modulation types that can be very very complex. We can see the uh, the constellation pattern of 32 APS key is uh, much harder to to demodulate and to increase the bandwidth even more even more for uh, packet data instead of using the the base symbol rate of 23. Thousand um, kilo symbol per second, they can actually use either uh, twice that symbol rate, four times that symbol rate, or five times uh, that symbol rate to uh, to just put even more data on the same on the same channel. Okay, so this was the RF layer. Um, the channel coding layer is what will take care of taking the layer two frames breaking them into bursts and ensure that they're transmitted correctly by applying uh, error correction and error checking. Every channel type in GMI uses, of course, a different method for it, uh, but hopefully they all use the, the same basic primitives, um, so that's, uh, that's kind of good news. And we have uh, implemented all of these, so essentially it's, it's very... It's the same primitive that are used in GSM and a lot of other protocols, that is uh, convolutional code, CRC checking, uh, scrambling to avoid uh, runs of zero of one that, uh, that would pose problem in the modulation stage. And uh, something interesting is uh, you can see here is the encryption is um, applied in layer one, um, like in GSM. Um, okay, LAPSAT is the data link layer. Um, honestly, I think it's a bit, uh, it's not a very interesting layer, <laughs> but uh, its role is mostly to take the variable size um, L3 messages and split them up into um, chunks that fit into bursts um, and um, ensure things like retransmission in case packets are lost, um, things like that. So layer three is uh, kind of the, let's say the application layer or something. Um, its lowest uh, sublevel is called radio resources. And it uh, oversees the establishment of dedicated link between the, the the phone and the satellite. This layer is completely different from GSM, which is kind of logic because the kind of radio resources that are uh, managed are, are different. Um, you will find the same concept. So, for example, you will find immediate assignment message. You will find paging messages. Um, Actually, you, find, you will find exactly the same types of messages, but the detail of how they are encoded and the information contained in them is, um, is different because, the, yeah, of course, the detail of the physical layer uh, are different. The upper layer, mobility management, which, which uh, provides uh, user location tracking and authentication and confidentiality, so exchanging the MZ for the TMZ, things like that. Uh, and the connection management layer are all common uh, with, uh, with GSM, and so um, we can reuse all the code that we already wrote for those. Okay, the, the speech codec was, uh, um, as I said, they, they used a, a new codec um, called AMBE, or at least the, the, f the codec family is called AMBE, standing for Advanced Multiband Excitation. Um, it's low bit rate to, uh, well, to feed the need of a satellite channel. Uh, unfortunately, it's proprietary by a company called Digital Voice, Voice System Incorporated. Um, there is no public specification whatsoever, and there is no reference impl implementation provided, um, which is kind of a problem for us because uh, <laughs> that means that we can't e uh, neither decode nor encode speech data. Um, hopefully there is kind of a two way we can get around that. The first one is uh, called MBELib. So the, the same family of, of codec is used in APCO 25 and uh, uh, DMR, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and someone implemented um, those particular variants. Um, they are different from the, the variant used in uh, GMR, but at least some of the concepts are similar. Unfortunately, the author is anonymous and we have no way to contact him uh, to ask him to, to, to see if he, if he has some, uh, some clue about how to decode uh, GMR uh, frames. So if, if by any chance you know him, uh, 
you know. <laughs> uh, the other um, lead we have is that, well, the phone codec is obviously implemented in the phone. Um, most likely in the phone DSP, because the phone DSP is uh, a TI DSP, and what a coincidence, DVSI provide TI DSP code source for their codec. So we could most likely try to find it in there, but this is going to be a lot of work. <laughs> and so if there is a way to bypass that, that that'd be nice. Um, from a security standpoint, um, uh, a few words. There is some good uh, and there is some bad. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if the good was intentional or just a byproduct of other uh, decision, but uh, it's there. The, f the first uh, good news uh, from a security standpoint is that the contention resolution does not echo um, the first message. So let me explain that uh, a bit. In GSM, something for an attacker, something that's very useful is that the first message sent by the phone to the network um, has two interesting properties. The first one is that it will always contain some form of unique identifier for the um, for the subscriber, either it's IMZ or it's TIMZ. So uh, that allows you to identify the channel. The other uh, nice property of this burst is that the BTS will, will actually echo the, con the content of this burst during the contention, contention resolution procedure. That means that even if you can only listen on the down link, which is very common, um, you still uh, can attribute a given dedicated channel to a given user. And this is something um, that has been used to do uh, targeted sniffing on GSM uh, and things like that. Uh, in GMR, uh, this is not the case. The it, technically, it could be echoed, but there is another option, and that other option is what is uh, always chosen as far as we can, uh, as we can tell, is that uh, it will transmit uh, like um, a CSC or a hash of the uh, original message. So the phone can still know if it was its message or not without actually revealing the message to the entire world. Um, another feature is that um, DTX, so this is discontinuous transmission, um, is heavily used in GMR. Uh, as I previously, previously said, power consumption of the satellite is, uh, is pretty important. And so when the satellite has nothing to say, it does not say anything. Contrary to GSM, where uh, on control channel, if the base station didn't have anything to say, it would just send an empty frame that is completely known and would provide lots and lots of known plain text for an attacker. Uh, in GMR, this is not the case. If the satellite has nothing to say, it would just say nothing. And so you don't have as many plain text uh, as you would have in, um, in GSM. Of course, it's not all good because uh, it's heavily based on GSM, and so some of the things are inherited. The security is entirely optional. Hopefully, on Turia, they actually use it. Um, some of the GSM attacks should be applicable as is, uh, most notably the RSTH de denial, denial of service and the IMSI detached denial, denial of service. I say should because uh, we haven't tested them. Um, for GSM, it was easy for us to set up a test network where we can test that in a controlled environment without impacting commercial network. Uh, here, we can't really start a, a denial of service attack on a satellite. Uh, I think they wouldn't like that. Uh, something else that's pretty bad is that the phone transmits lots of private information in the RACH. So when you take your phone and try to place a call or power it on or do any kind of transaction, the first thing it will need to do is establish a dedicated channel between the phone and the satellite. To do that, it transmits what's called a request access uh, burst um, in the RSTH. And uh, here, this burst actually contains lots of um, information in clear text because there's no way to cipher it yet. Um, like the position of your phone, so each time you establish a channel, you essentially broadcast to the entire world where you are, and also why you want a channel. And in the why part, um, if you're actually placing an outgoing call, this will include the number that you are dialing. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's bad, <laughs> obviously. Um, and finally, the, the cipher is still applied at, at, uh, at layer one. Uh, 
Um, about the cipher itself, um, it's currently unknown. It's supposedly derived from A52. Uh, the, the spec uh, kind of strongly hints at that, and some other people have told us that, but uh, that's about all we know. Uh, we actually tried A51 and A52 just in case it was, uh, it was that, and we tried some minor modification on them, but it didn't work. So, yeah, uh, we're, we're looking into it. The, however, we can still look into uh, what could we do once we get the cipher. Um, as I said, the, inf the availability of plain text is going to be more limited than in GSM. Uh, mostly because of the discontinuous transmission, so there is no idle frames that we can use. Uh, another source of known plain text in GSM was the SACCH, so the, uh, a slow associated control channel that was basically a channel that kept repeating the same thing over and over again. Uh, that channel doesn't exist here, so no way to use that. And finally, the, the actual channel burst has a lot less bits per burst, meaning you have, uh, even if you have known plain text, um, you have less of it by, by burst uh, that you can exploit. Um, although we don't know the cipher, we know that, well, past experience has shown that uh, uh, the kind of protocol they the standardized, like A51, A52, GA1, GA2, um, were not especially strong. So, um, and um, especially when you, if you just Google for like a Turaya intercept, you will find commercial crackers that claim that they can intercept uh, the channel in a few seconds. So you can kind of imagine that the cipher must not be that strong if it can be broken in a, in a few seconds. Okay, so we'll now look at the actual software stack we wrote. Uh, But first, um, a bit of history about this project. So, as I said, it's uh, relatively new. It was started um, around mid-July, uh, when um, Arald sent a, sent a mail uh, saying, yeah, um, I've been looking into GMR with Dieter, and uh, he started a, a wiki where information started collecting. Um, a few weeks after that, uh, Dimitri actually managed to receive the first signal from the satellite. Um, and seen them on the, on the FFT, and um, as if you remember the slide with the FCCH, you could see the the cross um, the cross pattern on the FFT is very clear. You you just can't miss it. Uh, the signal reception work was continued at uh, at CCC camp. Uh, if you went by the radio tent, you should have seen the satellite dish outside. Um, and finally, in September, around mid September. We had the first packet being demodulated, and we started analyzing them. Uh, it took some time to clean the code and, uh, and make something that we, we could release and that other people could use. That happened uh, somewhere in October. And more recently, we added support for uh, uh, TCH tree channel types. Um, so, Osmo GMR is more than the is more than is more than just the Osmo GMR git. Um, it's uh, it's composed of several parts that must uh, that work together to create a, a reception chain. It all starts with the capture utility that essentially captures the radio signal and saves it to a C file. So complex samples are very common in a software defined radio. Those are processed by the GMR1 Eric, which is our main, uh, main uh, test software application, and therefore added or to uh, an extended version of GSM tap to Wireshark, where we can see the packet content and start looking at to, uh, into the data that are, uh, that are exchanged. So let's, uh, let's start with capturing. Uh, first step is the antenna. Essentially, anything that can receive the correct band of frequency with uh, left hand circular polarization is going to work. Uh, omnidirectional are not especially good, so you really need something kind of directional. Uh, but it can be quickly act together. Uh, the, um, the first version was a, uh, a satellite dish, which uh, had very good gain and very good directivity, but uh, unfortunately is not very practical. Uh, the second uh, antenna that was built was a helical antenna, and it's a fairly good uh, 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 trade-off between performance and uh, convenience, and it's relatively easy to build. You can uh, you can build one in a few hours. 
and um, uh, Steve actually tried a, a B quad uh, that seems to work very well and it's also very easy to construct uh, from PCB etching. So the, the details for this one are not uh, on the wiki yet, but uh, hopefully they will soon be. On the UF, once you have uh, captured the signal uh, through an antenna, you can go through the optional step of amplifying it and, uh, and filtering it. Uh, both the steps are optional because it, since we are in the optimal coverage zone, the signal is quite strong enough that if you have a fairly good antenna, it's, it's going to work just fine. However, maybe you just you, you want to receive more than just the primary spot beam. Maybe you want to receive spot beams that are not centered to your particular location and you want to look at the neighbor's spot beam and those will be weaker. So you need to um, amplify the signal to get it out of the noise. Um, if you are near um, a strong transmitter, you also may need to, to filter the signal because um, 1.6 gigahertz is, is, is kind of near some, uh, some strong um, carrier and if you have too much gain without filtering, you might end up saturating the input stage of your uh, software-defined radio. Um, there are various options available. One of the cheapest way to get a, a working um, amplifier only is actually to use a, G a modified GPS LNA. So if you know those GPS antenna, uh, that you can buy for very cheap. They have like a ceramic antenna on top and you can just remove the ceramic antenna, remove the GPS filter on the PCB and just use the, uh, the LNA on the antenna and since the GPS frequency is actually pretty close from the uh, GMR frequency, they will work just fine. Mm -hmm. So capture hardware. Uh, you can use any software-defined radio you like as long as it can save C files, uh, but our capture utility has a, a, a specific support for uh, UHD, so basically any ATUS hardware there is, you should be able to use as long as you have a matching data board for the, the correct frequency, of course. One interesting particularity of the USAP1 is that since you can put two data boards, you should be able to listen to both uplink and downlink simultaneously. Um, it should be possible with the other ATUS products, uh, but you will need a GPS, um, uh, one PPS pulse to synchronize the various um, USAP between them. So it's a little bit more complicated product uh, um, setup. Sorry. The cheapest option you can have is the FunCube Dongle Pro, uh, which is this little USB stick that has been uh, released uh, some time ago. Um, which actually works very well for GMR. It's, it has a small bandwidth, so you can't capture a lot of RFCAN simultaneously, uh, maybe three adjacent uh, channel at a time, but it works very well and it has a, a actually pretty good sensitivity and it's been used uh, successfully. And soon, obviously, there will be the Osmo SDR, uh, which is a new project um, Harald announced uh, not so long ago on his blog. The software you use for capture is called the GMR Multi RX. It's based on GNU Radio and will handle all the nasty details for you. Um, it will choose the, the optimal frequency to tune to to avoid the DC peak so that you don't have DC peak in the middle of your signal. It will automatically channelize and resample so that the uh, demodulation uh, part has a nice uh, four sample per second or something. Um, and all you have to do is really you just uh, compile it for the uh, for the hardware you want, and then just give him the the frequency you want to listen to, and uh, it will just figure out everything else uh, itself, and you will end up with two .c file that you can feed to the next step of the process. So when we started writing the actual software defined radio part for um, Osmo SDR. Uh, we realized that we didn't have um, a lot of the mathematics uh, helpers that, uh, that, w that were required. And so we create a very simple library that has just what we need um, and that, uh, that fits very well with uh, the other uh, Osmocom library. This one is called DevOsmo SDR and essentially what it is is support for complex vectors, um, so IQ data and a very common operation on them like um, 
removing the DC offset uh, convolution correlation, basically all the small primitives you will need when you implement um, software defined radio. Um, the actual software defined radio part of Osmo GMR is um, located in under S SLC SDR and um, it has several jobs. The first of which is FCCH acquisition. So this very specific waveform, um, the process I explained with the correlation in the FFT, it's implemented in there so that given um, a random capture, we will need to find um, first, is there a carrier at all uh, there? And uh, if there is, what is the, the proper alignment and the, um, the frequency offset um, to, to compensate for it? The, um, the process we have works very well and it actu can actually find multiple overlapping carrier because of frequency reuse you, you can sometimes have uh, channels where you have uh, two carriers at once that are shifted in time and the, the, the implementation we have can, some, can, uh, can manage to lock to, uh, to, the, to both synchronization and extract data from both overlapping channel. Um, so obviously we need a demodulator to yep, uh, we need a demodulator to get the data out of the burst. Um, so we just wrote a, um, a generic the CQPSK demodulator and the CBPSK, so it's handled as a as a special case. Um, and this layer also contains the description of the various burst types. So you have SDCCH, TCH, uh, the various training sequences that are used and everything. And it's all in library form. So the, this layer is essentially a set of primitives to be used by some, some application to, to, perform, um, to perform the functions. It's currently uh, reception only, so only the demodulation part. But writing the modulation part which should actually be easier because uh, Modulation is just generating the the, the proper uh, signal envelope and uh, and mix it with the transmission window. But it's something that we haven't um, done yet. So layer one, that's uh, the channel coding layer. We have implementation for some of the primitives. Uh, so essentially, scrambling the various convolutional codes that are used in uh, in GMR. Uh, puncturing all the CIC schemes that I used and the interleaving schemes that I used. And we also have um, stateless coders and decoders for some of the channel types. The most important one being the BCCH, which is the broadcast channel. So that's uh, essentially the system information messages that describe the network and, and tell the phone uh, what network is on, uh, what uh, are the neighbor, uh, the neighbor uh, cell, and, and things like that. CCCH for um, paging and um, immediate assignments. And FACCH3 and TCH3 are the actual traffic channel where user data is exchanged. So these uh, are dedicated channels. This entire uh, layer is, uh, supports encoding and decoding um, completely. So obviously, uh, since the both previous layers are just uh, primitives and, and the helper function, um, we need something that actually uses them. Usually it would be the higher layer, like uh, layer two, layer three, and stuff like that, but we haven't actually coded that yet. So instead, we have a test application whose, uh, whose main job is just um, do the equivalent uh, that AirProbe does for, uh, for GSM. Uh, that is, you give him a, a C file where you think there is a carrier, it will try to acquire synchronization, um, extract all the broadcast channel types like BCCH and CCCH, and if by any chance on the CCCH it sees an immediate assignment to uh, supported channel types like TCH3, it will follow it, decode the TCH3 data, and forward all of that to GSM tab for further analysis on, uh, on Wireshark. So Wireshark, um, this was actually a, lo uh, a lot of work because um, you don't realize it when you use Wireshark, but writing the dissector that display all the data nicely is kind of a painful process. Uh, and uh, no, I am very grateful for all the developers who <laughs> actually implemented all the protocol that, uh, that I analyze. Uh, 
So what has been implemented is the, the data link layer, LAPSAT, is completely implemented. The BCCH is uh, partial. Uh, you, you will see in the, in the capture that I will show that uh, we only decode some of the system information messages um, because they, they are coded in a very um, annoying way, that is, they are uh, unaligned bit fields de described in a CSN1 uh, concrete. If you saw the talk by Harald, uh, it's the same CSN1. Um, CCCH, it's the, the dissection is incomplete, but we have support for all the message tabs that we have seen so far on Turaya. So even though we don't support like the, the dozens of types of messages that are uh, described in the specification, every message you see um, should be uh, dissected and, and displayed properly. If you find one that isn't, keep the capture, post it to the mailing list, and we will add support for it. Um, same thing for the RR layer, radio resources. That is uh, all the message we've seen so far are dissected. The upper layer, since they are completely common with GSM, we obviously didn't rewrite the code and we just forward those data to the, the, the pre-existing GSM dissector from, uh, from Wireshark. So um, we can take a look at what a GMR signal looks like. Um, so this is um, a representation uh, of, the, of a GMR signal. So on, the, on this axis, you have the frequency, and this is time. And so you can clearly see here the synchronization pattern. And then um, all, all of this, is just, there is just no transmission. Uh, it's slightly lighter blue than this, because this is actually filtered out by, uh, by uh, FIA filters uh, to channelize the, the thing. But uh, this is just noise. And here you have the burst of data. Um, those small bursts are actually the GPS um, ephemeris data that are transmitted periodically so that the phone can lock on, uh, at least is supposed to lock on faster. Not sure it actually works, but um, this is BCCH and these are um, CCCH. Um, but as you can see, you, once you see that, in, if you're trying to receive GMR, you just display it uh, in a waterfall display. And uh, if you can see this kind of pattern, you know you found a GMR carrier. There is just no doubt about it. It's very distinctive. Um, so, well, obviously, I, I can't uh, really capture a signal live because, well, we're inside. Uh, but I have some, some pre recorded signal that I can process. Um, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's not, really, it's not really readable on the screen, but. Uh, Wireshark should be readable. Um, let me launch Wireshark. Uh, So here I'm just calling the uh, the main application. So yeah, you can't read it, but it says GMI one Rx. The first argument is four. It's just the number of uh, sample per symbol. Uh, four is the optimal value, so just just use four. Uh, then I can give him two uh, C file. The first one is the BCCH, and the second one is. Uh, um, where the TCH is going to be assigned. Because we can't currently follow uh, live, um, you have to kind of know where the TCH are going to be assigned. Hopefully, in Turia, you just take the BCCH number, you add one, and the channel are going to be assigned there. So, so that's pretty easy. And uh, when you launch it, it will just decode everything uh, pretty quickly and forward everything to, to Wireshark. So what can we see? The, the first thing you can see here is the uh, BCCH, so they are the broadcast information, and uh, as you can see, the dissection is somewhat complete until you actually reach here. Um, the, the actual message content is, uh, is not decoded. We only have support for a few uh, segments, um, segment 2A, which contains all the synchronization information, like the current frame number, uh, and, and some offsets. 
and another type we support is segment 3A. And it, this one contains very, uh, very interesting information because it broadcasts um, the name of the network. I mean, the name is the MNC MCC. So you can see 9015 is the code for Turaya. Um, you can find the location area code, which in GMR is split between the MSC ID and what's called the spot beam ID, so just the, the number of the, the, the spot beam you are on. And more interestingly, you can find the beam center position. So you can know that this beam is actually centered on those GPS coordinates. And uh, one of the first thing we did is just try to map all the beam that we managed to receive. And these are the beam center position of the, all the beams we've been able to receive so far. Um, the reception was from some from Belgium and some from uh, from Germany. So you can see that you can capture data uh, from beams that are pretty far away. Um, our current assumption is that the beam forming algorithm has some side lobes and we are seeing um, those side lobes are mostly here. Um, so these, all these are broadcast information, but of course uh, at some point there will be uh, let me find it. Uh, okay, so here you can see an immediate assignment. There's a, a channel is being assigned, and uh, this this was actually me making a call, and uh, and you will you will find the channel description that says, okay, go to RFN RFK 268 on the time slot 13, and if we filter by channel type and only display the dedicated channel. You can see here all the communication that has happened between my phone and the, and the network. So first, uh, empty frame with nothing, and then you can see the authentication request exactly the same as in GSM. So because um, since this is done by the uh, mobility management layer, it's common with GSM. Uh, and then you can see the ciphering mode command that activates ciphering. Um, and you can see it requests A51 which is not actually the same A51 as in uh, GSM. And it also, for some reason, transmits a string that tells the phone to display uh, Belgium on the display. I have no idea why they put that in the ciphering mode command, but they did. Um, and of course, after that, you can't see anything because it's ciphered, and although it's my phone, I have the corresponding key, but I don't have the actual algorithm to <laughs> decode the, the data, so this will come later on. <laughs> Uh, so, what do we plan to do next? Well, find what's missing, so essentially find the cipher, it's in the phone, somewhere. Uh, find the speech algorithm, same, same thing, it's in the phone, somewhere. Uh, implement the upper layers, uh, try to, instead of manually coding all the message type, um, uh, try to create code generators that can actually pass the specification and, and automatically generate uh, marshalling and uh, demarshalling methods. Uh, the transmit side, hopefully one day. Um, if you want to implement something, uh, feel free to do so. <laughs> uh, I'd like to t take a moment to thank uh, uh, the people who contributed to this project. Uh, most notably, uh, Dimitri for uh, doing all the groundwork in, uh, in the early capture and, uh, and writing the actual capture tool that is uh, so easy to use. Harald for uh, well, starting the project and getting us interested in, uh, in GMR in the, in the first place. And, uh, and Steve for the, all the research he did into uh, finding a good way to capture the signal easily with uh, readily available hardware. Uh, you can read uh, the specification. Um, as I said, you will need both the GMR spec and the GSM spec because there's a lot of reference. And you can visit the wiki, there's a lot of information as well as getting started and how to get, uh, how to get things running. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. So do you have any question? Any question? It was heavy, I know. Okay.
Ja, sehr, sehr spannende Frage. So, what's your plan for getting the cipher out of the phone? I mean, with the codec, it's probably a program on the DSP. I get that, but I would guess the cipher is actual hardware. Actually, it's not. Because we found uh, someone who published, a, uh, some Korean firm who developed the phone, published a paper about the architecture of the phone, and you can clearly see the cipher unit being in the OMAP DSP processor. At first, we thought it was in the, uh, in the uh, because there is um, an ASIC in it, and we thought it, it's going to be in the ASIC. And then we found this paper, which actually described the architecture of this ASIC, and you can see that it's not. The ASIC is purely uh, um, software-defined radio stuff. Um. Uh, do you have a dump of that firmware already, or is it off the phone, or do you need to get it out? I'm sorry. Uh, do you have a dump of that firmware already, or do you need to get it out of the phone? Uh, we have uh, we have the firmware update. The firmware update files are available on uh, on the internet uh, freely, and they load very nicely in ADA. So we 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 actually have it. What we're looking for, though, is a broken phones. Uh, so if you have if you have some. So presumably you over here, Sylvain. Yeah, I'm sorry. Where are you? Oh, okay, hi. Hi. So presumably you will be able to use one of these broken phones to use it as a black box for the codec and uh, the encryption. Um, yeah, for the for the encryption, we're hoping to to actually uh, extract it because uh, encryption tends to be relatively easy to spot and, and extract. Um, usually they're quite small. On the other hand, the speech codec is probably quite large, and so in the first uh, time, uh, maybe we'll just find how to feed the data to the phone, have it decompress, and, uh, and get the data. Or maybe just run the, the DSP image in a DSP emulator. I mean. Yeah, here is a question from the net. Yeah. Can you sniff a, uh, oh, sorry, ARFCH channel data with standard, with standard hardware like Osmo Comp BB? Uh, no, you cannot, you cannot use the Osmocom BB uh, phone hardware to sniff GMR channels because um, the symbol rate is different, the frequency band is different, and, well, that's quite enough, actually. It just, just won't work. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, are all the spots, are all the spots active all the time, or, or is it just when there's a phone you need to have have a phone to activate some spots no, or something? No, the, um, the spot beams are all active uh, at the same time, um, at least as far as, the, as, as far as we can see, as far as the spec is concerned. There are some provision to, uh, I mean, they can reconfigure the spot if they want to like, allocate more spot for, uh, for uh, an area because they have more subscriber or stuff like that, but spot beams are not activated on demand because the phones uh, need the spot beam to synchronize. However, when a spot beam, uh, um, as, as you saw on the capture, um, most of it is actually, most of the time, it's actually not transmitting anything. So, yeah, if there is nothing to say. Uh, are you aware of any currently available phones that you can use as a GS, uh, GMR modem, such as the uh, analogous to GSM modem with 80 commands? Yes, uh, this one has, uh, has 80 commands, and they also have. Um, um, de dedicated, um, dedicated modem, so there is no phone, it's just a, de a data modem for, uh, for con data connection. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any plans on emulating or studying the space section? Yes. Actually, that's probably one of the first things we're going to try on the TIG side of things because generating a static uh, carrier beam uh, should actually be fairly easy. Uh, we, I mean, uh, we did it for GSM uh, uh, pretty, pretty quickly uh, ju just, just to make it appear in the network list. So I suspect that for GMR, it shouldn't be too hard to replicate that. Uh, and they've been running, yes. <laughs>